Greetings, my name is Aaron Balavay and this is Mitran Guandalfa, Secretly Transmitted Methods of the Guandao, a very nerdy series in which I discuss all things Guandao. In this video I'm going to be talking about two weapons in my collection, the Hanwei Pudao and uh, this weapon above which is a kind of a Frankensteinian creation of my own uh, using a Hanwei Pudao blade. So neither of these weapons are actually Guandao. Uh, the, we have, so we have a Pudao, or also known as Pudao, and then this weapon could probably be uh, thought of as a late Ming Janma Dao. Now these two terms are kind of complicated, both, both Pudao uh, slash Pudao and Janma Dao. These names can, were used to describe different weapons during different time periods, depending on who was talking about it. If you are interested in uh, the, these names and kind of the development of these weapons in the late imperial period. I highly recommend you check out some of the videos by uh, Chad Eisner, aka Chad Ironmonger, and he also has a really excellent blog post about this. I, so I, I'll put, post those in the down below. I, I very strongly recommend you, ch you check them out. So I'm gonna, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things I like about the Hanwei Pudao, and then I'll talk about the process of deconstructing it, and then reforming it as, as the blade I have above me. Um, uh, it's not, I'm not going to do a formal review of the Hanwei Pudao uh, because I don't think it's necessary because it's already been done. I think that uh, Skelligrim has a, uh, a review of the weapon. I'll put that in the down below as well. And I recommend, if you're thinking about buying one, I highly recommend you check that out. That was the review that sort of convinced me to bu buy one as well. Um, but I will now... I will uh, sort of discuss some of the things that Skelligrim brings up in his review and talk a little bit about my own experiences with the weapon. So one of the things right off the bat that uh, Skelligrim points out kind of as a big uh, downside to the blade, a big, a big weak point, is that when he was practice cutting with the weapon and doing some thrusts with the tip, uh, the tip of the blade actually bent and he says that this is, you know, this could be, this could suggest that the steel is a bit soft, and it, but it also could just be that the, the geometry of the blade is kind of off, that it gets just gets too thin and weak here towards the tip. So his solution was to grind the blade and fix the geometry so that it wasn't quite so slender at the tip. Now, for me, I don't do a lot of practice cutting. So it's not a big concern for me right now. So I, I haven't done any of that reforming. I'm also scared to take my blade to a grinder because I'm not that experienced with it. Uh, but if you are very into practice cutting and you want a Hanwei Puda or you own one, um, that's definitely something I would, I would say to consider. Uh, some of the cheaper Guandao and Pudao with very flimsy blades and kind of way too light for a pole weapon um, and even, or even heavier versions like this, um, the, the, the feel of them, the balance of them, just doesn't, doesn't feel as nice and as solid as the Hanwei Pudao. And there's a particular reason for that, which I'll talk about in, in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, but what, so one thing that Skullagrim really kind of brings up as a, that I think is a really good point is that uh, in, the, in the price point for this, so this is about... Uh, $200 US. You can find it some places for less than $200 US. Of course, by the time you play, pay for shipping, depending on where you are, it's probably going to be in the $200, $250 USD range, um, which is extremely good, I would say. I mean, you know, everyone's got their own financial situation, uh, but uh, this is still kind of lower or middle range for, for martial arts weapons. Um, and uh, in that sense, this weapon is a lot of bang for your buck. And there really aren't any other good options. Uh, you can get a lot of these uh, Chinese-made, Chinese martial arts weapons in a lower price range. Uh, but then it, going to, moving to the next step up, you can get some higher-end martial arts ones. I've seen ones around like $800 to $1,000 USD, which is really quite expensive. And I've never seen any good or detailed reviews of those weapons. So I think it's, it's a very kind of dangerous pur purchase. And I, I wouldn't dare to kind of 
um, risk that much of an investment on, on just a martial arts weapon. Wish I could, but I, I cannot. Um, and then the, the, the next best, or the, the even better option, of course, would be to find someone to make you a blade. But, you know, you're going to want uh, thousands of dollars US for that. And again, it's a, a steep price for, you know, for something you're using for martial arts. At least for me. So, uh, so the Hanwei Pudao is really, it's kind of, in a sense, it's almost your only option. Um, so I used this weapon for a, a while, and I really like the way it feels, and I would use it for uh, Pudao forms, for form practice. But then I would also use it for Guandao practice, because, again, there just really aren't any better options out there. And of course, it, it but the problem is, is that it, it's just, it's not a Guandao. So in particular, it's just not that long, and a ring, a ring pommel at the at the butt end, it just doesn't do it. So you know there are a lot of things in a, in Guandao practice where you use the spear tip, and of course you could pretend there's a spear there. But um, another issue is that there, there just isn't very much weight in this ring pommel, so you can assume that the balance is 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 not correct for a Guandao even though it's good for, uh, for other Dao pole arms. So when I came to this, this similar conclusion to what Skullgrim was saying, that you know, there really just aren't any other options, I figured, well, I don't want to spend all the money to have someone make my weapon for me, but I can try to make one myself. And I like the Hanwei Pudao so much, I figured I can try to make you know, an, my own Frankensidian uh, pole arm. So that's what I did. So um, now let's talk a little bit about that process, which begins with deconstructing the Hanwei Puda, taking this thing apart. So the first step is very simple. It's just taking off this, uh, this red cord. I'm going to play a clip that I filmed right after I had removed cord on my first Hanwei Puda. Um, and I'm not going to play the audio. I'm just going to kind of just quickly describe some of the observations I made at that time. And the, the, the kind of the big takeaway was just that I thought that the Hanwei Pudao looks quite handsome and, and felt good to practice with without the red cord. Uh, originally, I thought that maybe the red cord was hiding some kind of un, unsightly uh, uh, issues with the handle, maybe like um, some seams in the way the wood was constructed or just, you know, or maybe the wood was just cheap and not very good. Um, but when I'd actually removed the cord, I thought that it, it looked quite nice, maybe even better than it looks with the cord. I like the cord, but if you don't like the cord, don't let that kind of turn you away from the Hanwei Puda. I think removing it, it still looks really nice. And maybe some blades have more blemishes than other. Um, it's hard, you know, hard to say because it's, it's hidden. Uh, but I think it's probably worth the gamble and any cosmetic issues you would have with the handle underneath the cord are probably fixable. So after removing the cord, the next big thing to deal with is the handle. So the handle is uh, it's a two-piece construction of oak. So the two pieces of oak are um, sandwiching the tang of the blade. Now this is, th this is what makes the Hanwei Pudao a really amazing weapon in the price range it is because it is full tang. It is a solid weapon literally because you know from blade to uh, ring pommel, it's one piece of metal, or at least it, it's welded together. So um, it's really kind of exceeded all my expectations. I kind of had the suspicion that it was full tang when I first was practicing with it, because it felt very solid, and I think that it also, you know, having a full tang helps distribute the weight across the entire blade, and it really gives it a, a, a wonderful feel. But I just thought it was too good to be true, especially in that price range. So I, I wasn't convinced that it was full tang until I took apart the handle. And then when I did, I, I was pretty excited. So um, there are two pieces of oak sandwiched around the, the tang. Um, and it is held together with glue. And p there are two pins about like a third up from the from the back of the blade and a third up from the guard. The handle fits into this part of the guard. It goes in probably half an inch or so, a couple, a centimeter or two. When I was constructing the handle for my own weapon, which I guess I should take that down now. 
So when I was constructing the handle for my own weapon, I decided to use the same construction method that the handway that the handway put out was made. So I I took my ash dowel and I split it entirely down the middle. I used a, a Dremel tool to create a little slot in each side of the dowel and then I sandwiched the two halves around the tang and I used uh, epoxy in some places but mostly I used a silicone adhesive uh, because based on the way uh, LK Chen uh, suggests, suggests assembling the, his, his hansha which is another long Chinese polearm he suggests that uh, silicone adhesive is, is maybe better because it has more flexibility to it, which um, I, I don't know a lot about adhesives, but that, that seemed to make sense for me. So I figured that would be the way to go. Just like the Hanwe Pudao is put together, there are a couple of pins. Um, now, uh, in the Dao uh, pole arms that I use, there's always a more substantial guard than the Hanwe Pudao has. So I actually added a guard on here. This is just kind of a a cheap uh, uh, katana tsuba. I bought it online. Uh, it was supposed to be made out of iron. I think it's just steel painted black. It's cheap. It's not great, but it does the it does its job, and I, it's held in place there with epoxy. Now, when I first got the handle assembled um, with the guard in place, uh, I was extremely nervous of the other weapon because so, so when you have a weapon that's very long, it's just it's it's wobbly. That's just kind of the the physical the reality of having a long weapon. Uh, Matt Easton at Scholar Gladiatoria has a really great video talking about wobbly weapons. I'll put that in the links down below. Um, but I was pretty nervous that this weapon would come apart, as specifically at this area here. It just felt weak. It felt like the the wood was going to split or break in some way, or the glue was not going to hold something like that. And that really made me really appreciate the fact that the Hanwei Pudao actually has the, the handle um, slotted into the guard. I think that's a, an excellent idea for construction. It gives you a very solid um, grip at the base of the blade, which would be a particularly a, a spot that is potentially kind of very weak and something could go wrong. Um, however, after I finished staining the blade and finished and I finished shaping the handle and did all that, then I added this, this uh, leather wrapping here. And the leather wrapping actually uh, put all of my anxieties at ease and I feel like it's a very solid weapon now. I was surprised because I'd always kind of assumed that leather wrapping was more for um, for comfort in, in grip or for you know just kind of aesthetics. I didn't realize how much kind of structural importance it has but it definitely I, I feel now when I practice with a weapon I can be pretty rough with it and I'm not really worried knock on wood that it's gonna like fall apart or anything like that. So now let's talk a little bit about the design of this weapon. So what I wanted when I was going to, when I started to kind of get this idea to construct the, uh, my own uh, dowel pole arm, I decided I wanted something that was you know, closer to historically accurate than the weapons I'd been practicing with, which isn't a very high bar to set, but uh, it seemed like something, you know, a good goal to shoot for. And I wanted something that was stable, solid enough to use in practice with my forms, but then also uh, to do pra a little bit of practice cutting with, should I be inclined to do that, and maybe even some light sparring. If so in, in terms of keeping it, you know, kind of shooting for a historical weapon, um, uh, the length I, I ended up making it is, uh, it's around 92 inches, so uh, I think that's 234 centimeters, give or take. Um, so that falls within the kind of the historical range for these weapons. You know, uh, in an earlier video, link below, um, I, I was talking. I pointed out that a lot of texts tend to put these between seven and seven and a half chert. So that's like kind of right, right in that in that range. And for me, this weapon. So it's also this weapon is as tall as when I stand up straight and raise my hand. So that's the length guideline given in Wu Bei Yao Lue. So again, we're kind of keeping consistent with the length given in that. Um, it's, it's, or it's just a, a kind of a, a slightly shorter than that, but, but pretty close. And then the weight of the weapon is around seven pounds, four ounces. 
um, which is, I think, around 3.3 kilos. Now, so that, uh, that also kind of falls within historical range, but part of the reason that it falls within historical range is because there's a kind of a, a very few sources that give us the weight of the weapon, and the range is very wide. Now, uh, overall, this weapon is actually quite similar to the, the size and shape given in the text, the late Ming text, uh, Jing Guo Xiong Lue. So in that text, the length is, is very similar. This blade is slightly heavier than that one. That one gives uh, five uh, jin, which would be, I think, uh, I'll have to, I'll put the, the, whatever the weight would be down here. It's, this blade is a little bit heavier compared to that. But the, um, the, the length of the blade, too, is also very similar. This blade is maybe an inch shorter than what's given in Jingguo Shunglu. That's around 30, 31 inches, and this is a 29 inch blade. Um, but overall, this is very, quite similar to the, the, the measurements given in Jingguo Shunglu. And then, uh, whoop. let's see. Ugh, pull arms are so hard to move around. No, the Velcro's caught. Okay, so the butt spike is, uh, it was just a, 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 a spear, or actually a, an actual butt spike I bought off of uh, Cult of Athena. This is actually a Greek, I think it's called a Sorator uh, butt spike. Um, so the, the historical sizes and shapes of the butt spike are kind of all over the place. So I just went with something that looked approximately like some of the ones that I'd seen. Um, uh, some of them are really quite small, some of them are really quite large. I wanted one that was a little bit larger because I wanted to have more weight to kind of balance the weight of the blade. Also, I, overall in my design, I was trying to add almost as much weight as possible because I, I, I'd been used to using a lot of light weapons and I wanted to see what a heavier one felt like. So I kind of added weight wherever I could. Okay, and so then I guess last but not least is the, the tang. So I, I kept the entire length of the Pudao tang when I built this weapon. Um, historically, it, it's, or it, it's hard to find uh, historical evidence for how long tangs were. I've definitely seen pictures of s some uh, Guandao and other Dao polearms that appear to have a kind of a small tang, and that's because th the construction that appears to be used in the photos I've seen is that instead of splitting the entire length of the handle down the middle, as I did, they just cut a slot in the back end and then kind of fit the blade inside and then, you know, put a small piece of wood, glue it, wrap it, and seal it that way, or, um, and pin it as well. And that's actually a similar construction that I've, I've seen uh, people use it for uh, the Japanese naganadas, which is kind of a, a similar polearm, much lighter but very similar. Um, which I think would be a, a, a practical solution for a, a shorter tang. And of course, modern blades often have shorter tangs. Tangs, you know, just a, a few inches, really not very long at all. But this is far too long, and I thought cutting a, an entire slot down the uh, the handle would be impractical. So I decided to just split the thing down the middle. Um, the, I also thought about cutting the tang uh, to keep it from being quite so long. Cause, so if, if we're comparing this blade to the one that's present in Jingguo Xionglu, uh, the tang in that, in that f uh, for that design is also quite long. It's around uh, 20 inches, whereas the, the blade is 30 inches. So it's almost as long as the blade. And that's a pretty good size for a tang. But I, I just kind of decided I would keep as much of the Hanwei Pudao tang as I could, because wh why, why, why mess with a good thing? Why, why take it away? The, I guess I lost some historical accuracy there, but uh, it seems worthwhile to me. Um, so th that's kind of the basic overview of how I constructed this, this weapon. Um, if you are interested in kind of some of the more gritty details. I'm not a great woodworker or metal worker. I'm a pretty amateur sword tinkerer at best. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I didn't go into too many specifics about uh, materials I use or, or how, I, how I did this. Uh, but feel free to ask me in the comments. I'm happy to go into more details. 
Uh, if you are interested in a similar kind of project, I'd be happy to speculate and kind of you know, help you learn from my mistakes. I would recommend trying to convert your own Hanwei Pudao uh, if you are like me and kind of looking for a Dao polearm in a lower end of the price range. Um, although I would say that if you don't have that many tools, you can expect to still have to spend a fair amount um, on tools and materials to construct the blade. It will, in the end, it will st definitely still be less than the the kind of the higher end martial arts guandao, or uh, of course it will still be less expensive than having someone um, make it for you from scratch. Um, and then of course it's really kind of an interesting process to to make the blade yourself and kind of you know play with things and think about how you would do it differently next time. So if you haven't dabbled in sword tinkering, I, I highly recommend it based on, based on this experience for me. Um, so that's all I have for this video. I just wanted to talk about deconstructing the Hanwei Pudao and then making another uh, a Dao, a, a Genma Dao here. Um, and in the next video, I will talk a little bit more about this weapon and I will perform a form and kind of talk about how it feels and, and compare how kind of the feeling of using uh, a more historically accurate blade like this compared to the kind of the modern martial arts guanda. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, of course I always appreciate a like and a subscribe or a share, word of mouth, it all, it's all good to me. Um, and I'll see you next time on Mitran Guandalfa, Secretly Transmitted Methods of the Guandao.